The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to get started in a couple minutes. We're just going to let a few other people um, join the webinar. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for 2023 Hot Topics in Financial Planning Discussion. I am Barbara Mayetta, and I'm a financial planner at 12 Points Wealth Management. With me today is Jack Duffy. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Um, my name is Jack Duffy. I'm a retirement plan analyst here at 12 Points, and I assist in education and administration on the 401k plans that we act as an advisor on. I became a financial planner because I strongly believe that all adults should understand their financial situation and have a plan for achieving their life goals. So today we are going to discuss three topics that are being widely considered and have an impact on your financial futures. So today we're going to begin by touching on the rising inflation that's been impacting everyone's wallet. And then we're going to discuss a few of the provisions from the new SECURE Act 2.0 that was signed into law in December by President Biden. And we'll finish up by talking about some Social Security changes that took effect on January 1st. So, Barbara, starting today with inflation, I know that it's been taking a, a lot out of people's wallets over these last 24 months. How did we end in 2022? Well, the annualized inflation rate for 2022 was down about a half percentage point from 2021, coming in at 6.5%. And it's been dropping since July when it hit a high around 9% this past summer. Additionally, the annualized inflation rate for January of this year continued to come down ever so slightly at 6.4%. So we continue to be moving in the right direction. And where are industry experts predicting that we finish the year? How's the rest of 2023 going? Well, there are lots of experts, but several, including Kiplinger's, are publishing predictions that will finish the year around 3.2%. 3.2% is higher than the Federal Reserve's target of 2 to 2.5%, which means that probably going into 2024, we're still going to be taking measures to continue to bring inflation down. All right. So it sounds like it's slow, which seems like a good thing. But I still look around and prices seems to be going up. What's what's going on with that? So because there is inflation and it's still at over 6%, its prices are going up. They're just not going up as fast. And there's actually some good news. There are a few segments that are actually starting to come down. Used cars, if you remember back during the pandemic, 
the prices went way up. Used cars in the last year have gone down to 8.8% or have gone down by 8.8%. And new car prices just recently have started to decline for the first time in two years. Gas prices we know are all over the place, but they continued to come down in December also, coming down 9% in December. And food prices, the ones that we really see every day when we go to the grocery stores, while they're still going up, they're not going up as quickly as they had been. All right, so if inflation for goods is slowing down, the other side of that coin would be services. What's going on with inflation when it comes to services? So. Inflation for services is actually still going strong. Service prices, inflation for service prices ha tends to be slower to move than inflation for goods. One of the in one of the service prices that's impacting a lot of us today is rents. Rents went up 7.6% last year and they haven't been turning around yet. So inflation for rents, other services, that the inflation rates haven't showed any signs in slowing yet. Um, but we're hoping that if the economy, as expected, starts to slow a little bit, service price inflation will also ease. All right. So this is a lot to unpack right here. And myself, as a saver, a lot of people who are listening on might be interested. What are some benchmarks that we can look for in 2023 as an indicator that inflation starting to come down. Well, Jack, no one has a crystal ball that will tell us what is going to happen. But we can t talk about what to look for. First of all, there are monthly announcements of what in how inflation rates are doing. But also with the market, the Federal Reserve considers themselves to be responsible for helping to bring down inflation rates. So, they do this by a raising short-term interest rates. So if we watch what they're doing, back in 2022, they raised rates a couple of times by 75 basis points, later in the year by 50 basis points, by the end of the year and the beginning of this year, their raises were 25 basis points. And they've signaled that they're still concerned about inflation, but not enough to make the really big increases to interest rates. So that's a good sign. Keep watching. If they start increasing the amount that they're raising short-term interest rates, that's a sign they're getting more concerned. But job market, well, that's still really tight. And that really tight means that the unemployment rate is very low. Right now, around 3.4%. Um, that was in January. And that's a five-decade low. If everyone's employed, they have money and they continue buying and that drives up demand for goods. And it's been driving up demand faster than we'd like or prices faster than we like. So we want to watch and see if the unemployment rate increases a little bit. And this will help bring inflation down. So the unemployment rate you're saying needs to go up. That typically isn't a good thing, right? Well, Unemployment rate of 5%, which we're at 3.4% now, but the unemployment rate of 5% is often considered full employment. This level of unemployment is enough to minimize inflation and allow workers to move between jobs. But those wanting full-time work should still be able to find full-time employment at 5%. Although sometimes it's not always in the areas that they prefer their occupation to be. All right. So it sounds like 2023 is going to be more of like a transition year. And hopefully by the end of that year, we're going to get to a spot where we're comfortable and where the economy is in a good place. Well, if the experts are correct, we hope so. All right. All right, Barbara. So Secure Act 2.0 signed into law December of 2022. What is it? So SECURE stands for Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement. Originally, 1.0, SECURE 1.0, was signed into law by President Trump in late 2019. It was designed to improve American financial readiness for retirement 
and increase the ability of people in retirement to preserve their wealth throughout their retirement. All good things, but this was a really big bill. And as with everything that big, it needs a little tweaking. So in December 2022, President Biden signed Secure Act 2.0. There are 92 separate provisions that help strengthen the retirement system, but today we'll cover only a handful, those that we think probably are most important um, to all of us. The areas we'll cover today, we'll talk about 401k retirement plans and some of the, some of the changes there. We'll talk about IRAs, individual retirement plans, and also 529 college savings plans. Sounds good. So, Barbara, a big part of what I do here at 12 Points is helping out participants with their 401k plan. And there's a lot of confusion surrounding that topic in general. I think it would be really beneficial if we kind of walked through what is a 401k plan and provided a little background on that. Great. So many of you listening today probably have a 401k account or know people who do. 401k plans are retirement accounts offered by employers that allow employees to save and invest their money for retirement. For traditional 401k plans, an employee tells their employer to withhold some of their earnings and put that into the employee's 401k account. The employee does not pay income tax on that money put into the account. And any investment earnings received are not taxed as long as that money remains in the account. There are some other rules that an employee should be familiar with before investing in a 401k. One of the big ones is that you can't take money out before age 59 and a half without paying a 10% penalty. Another one is that when an employee retires and begins taking money out, they've, that's when they will have to start paying income tax on all of the money that they take out. There's another kind of 401k, other than the traditional that I just spoke of, that are called Roth 401ks. This type of account has an employee put money into the account and pay taxes on that money in the year that they put that money in. Um, then that money grows tax-free, and so long as the employee follows all of the rules associated with the account, when they take money out, they won't pay any income tax on that money. So when they're making those withdrawals in retirement, no taxes. There's another really neat thing that, um, that employers can do with 401k retirement plans. And many employers choose to do this, which is to offer a matching contribution. So for employees who are putting money in, the employers match a percentage of the, employ the employee's salary. Um, I've seen it between about zero and 7%. All right. So a 401k is obviously a great savings vehicle. Can I just put as much money as I want into my 401k? Mm, keep dreaming, Jack. But we, uh, you can't. You can only put in up to what you earn and within the IRS caps. So just real briefly here, uh, the chart on this page shows that in the year 2023, an individual can put up to $22,500 into their account. And everything that the employee and the employer put in together can't exceed $66,000 unless the employee is over, is 50 years or older. And that's what we call this catch up contribution, which is now at $7,500, $7,500. An employee over the age of 49, 50 and older, can put in an extra $7,500 a year to help catch up to be ready for retirement. All right. And is Secure Act 2.0 bringing about any changes to these contribution limits? Yeah, they're doing an interesting thing. We call it the reverse donut hole. Um, so once you're over 50 or 50 and over, your catch up contribution is at a certain amount. And then for four years, the years you're 60, 61, 62, 63, you can increase your contribution to 150% of whatever the catch-up contribution is. 
But then once you turn 64, it goes back down again to whatever the catch-up contribution maximum amount is. So won't complain. It allows people for four years to give extra to help catch up for their um, retirement. This doesn't become effective until 2025. All right. Well, other than that, are there going to be any other big changes that Secure 2.0 is going to make to the 401k space? Well, let me talk about a couple that I really like because I think this really helps motivate young workers to begin saving for retirement early. Um, I mentioned that I mentioned earlier that employers can choose to match an employee's contribution. With this new act, an, an employer can, if they choose to offer this feature, can treat an employee's payments to their student loans as if it was a 401 contribution and then take that student loan payment into consideration when they calculate their matching contribution and put it in the 401k account. So really neat, you actually get paid into your 401k account for paying off your student loans. I think that's great. Hopefully everyone who has student loans starts, signs up for their 401k. Um, another thing that, um, I think helps get people started is beginning with new plans in 2024, there's going to be a mandatory enrollment. So now uh, with these new plans, all employees coming into that plan will automatically be signed up to participate in the 401k. Um, usually starting with a salary deferral of about three to five, three to 10 percent, and then it will increase automatically one percent up to ten uh, percent or they can choose up to fifteen percent the to me this is a, this is a good thing fifteen percent is about in the range of what we normally tell people uh, especially younger people that they ought to be saving for retirement every year so that is good but don't take this as this is the federal government telling you you have to participate in a 401k plan they are saying you're going to be automatically enrolled, but you have the option to opt out. So you do not have to stay in that plan if you don't want to. Um, and this new um, feature starts in 2024. Awesome. So without going into too much detail, because I know our time today is quite limited, are there any other features that you might want to talk about, you know, quickly mention on, you know, related to the 401ks and Secure Act? Sure. Um, a couple of them that, that I like. Once again, this is because I think they're helpful to encourage employees to participate in their 401k programs. One option is called the emergency savings account, which is attached to an employee's retirement account. And the an employee can put up to $2,500 in this emergency savings account, and they can get that money out without the penalty for the case of emergencies. And as I've mentioned several times, there's lots of little rules around most of these features and you should become familiar with them before using them. But that's a great one. I also like it because it introduces the idea to young folks of having an emergency savings account, which is really important. We suggest when working with our clients that they keep somewhere between 30 and 50% of their, of their salary in a savings account that they can easily take out for emergencies. You lose your job, the roof blows off your house, whatever, you have a medical emergency that you have big bills for, whatever it is, it is good to have access to some cash to take care of things that you need to take care of. So I think this is, is good. It's not a lot of money you can put in there, but it's a good path forward. Um, Another thing is that we do see a lot of people like to use the Roth portion of the 401k. Under today's rules, when an employer puts in their match, it has to go into the traditional portion of the IRA, uh, to the of the 401k. And people would prefer it was going into the Roth portion with the rest of their contribution. So starting, um, I think it's also 2024, employers can put it into the Roth portion. There's also going to be a tax credit for contributions to traditional retirement accounts 
up to 50% of the first $2,000 of contribution. This also has qualifications mostly for lower income earners, but this is really great because if they put in the full $2,000 contribution, they get a $1,000 tax credit. So I think this can really help out lower income earners and to kind of motivate them to at least be putting in $2,000 a year. Awesome. So we kind of covered 401ks right there. And I think the next step would be to look over IRAs. Um, tell me a little bit about these. So an IRA is an individual retirement account. So these aren't offered by your employer. You go out and get one of these yourself. And they help people save for retirement in a tax advantage way, similar to the 401k. There are two different types of them, also a traditional and a Roth. There are lots of rules around these, but basically an, indiv an individual puts money in annually. Um, and whether the contribution is tax deductible or not, there are several rules around that uh, I can't go into here. So please be sure to look into that or give us a call or an email and, and ask us about it. But if you're considering an IRA, you should be come familiar with those rules. Also, not everyone can contribute to the Roth IRA. Some, in the Roth 401k, if it's offered by your employer, there are no limits on who can contribute to that. In a Roth IRA, there are income limits. So once again, look into whether you qualify to be able to make contributions to a Roth IRA. The other thing, similar to 401ks, there can be penalties for withdrawals before 59 and a half um, with IRAs also. So, you know, be careful of that. Make sure you're putting the money in there and it's for retirement. All right. So IRAs, 401ks, they seem kind of similar, but their contribution limits are a little bit different, correct? Yes. You cannot contribute nearly as much to an IRA as you can to a 401k. With an IRA, the limit is $6,500 for someone who is under age 50. And if you're 50 or above, you can put in an additional $7,000, bringing you up to $7,500 for the year. Also, similar to the 401k, you can't put in more than you earn. So you need to make sure you are earning at least that amount. I like IRAs for, I've set them up for my children. Uh, Roth IRAs in this particular case, because they get, they're in college, they don't earn that much money. But it's a great way to get your your children started to think about retirement and a place for them to put a little bit in at a time, especially when they're not earning very much. Awesome. So, Barbara, I've only been here at 12 points for a couple of months now, and I hear this one acronym thrown around constantly, and that's RMD. Can you describe to me what is an RMD? Sure. RMD stands for Required Minimum Distributions for IRAs. So back when IRAs were first introduced to the retirement community, people put money in. A lot of it was qualified, meaning they didn't pay taxes on the money that went in. And it's been growing tax deferred for a very long time. And so at some point, the government kind of saw, looked at the IRAs and said, wow, there is a lot of tax revenue in those that maybe, you know, we should be encouraging people to take that out so we can get our tax revenue a little bit later because we don't want a lot of people living to 99 and dying with all of that. And then we don't get our tax revenue for a very long time. So they initially started with what they call a required minimum distribution. They gave you all kinds of tables and make it a eh, little bit complicated to calculate, but they do it in a way so that the calculation, so that your money is, is coming out over the remainder of your life. And initially they started it so it had to be taken out beginning in the year you turned 70 and a half. Uh, recently it moved up to age 72. And with Secure Act 2.0, they have made it so that people who were born 1950 to 1959 do not have to start taking their RMDs until they're 73, or people who were born in 1960 or later 
don't have to start taking it until 75. And this can help the, the, this population keep their money longer in retirement and maybe keep their financial health a little bit better during that time. Awesome. So we've discussed 401ks, we've discussed IRAs, another savings vehicle that I know from personal experience, Barbara, that you are very fond of yourself using them to you know, help fund your own kids' education would be a 529 college savings plan. Do you mind speaking on one of the, on those a little bit more? Sure. Yeah, I love these. I've used them um, and they can be very helpful. So this is a, a special type of account designed to help people save for college in a, once again, very tax efficient way. You put money into the account that you have already paid taxes on, and then that money grows tax-free until you take it out, so long as you take it out for a qualified ex educational expense, then you never pay taxes on the earnings. So if you think about little Sally, if I put money in when she is born, it can grow for 18 years before I even take a dime out for her education. And I get a whole lot of earnings that I never pay taxes on, and I can apply all of that to pay for little Sally's education. Very helpful. Love these accounts. Yeah, these sound these sound great. I mean, there have been a lot of changes just in the industry recently. Are these changing at all? Yeah. As a matter of fact, they're making them even better. So one one thing that I hear from a lot of our clients, they have concerns about, oh, if I put too much money in and Sally doesn't use, we don't use all that money for Sally's education. You know, now it's stuck in here and I'm going to have a 10% penalty if I take it out, if it's not for a qualified expense. So what do I do? And there are even in the current rules already things built in to help with that. So if Sally doesn't use it for education, but I've got two more kids, I can take Sally's and divide it and put it in 529s for the other kids so they can use it. As a matter of fact, I can use this on a wide range of um, my relatives if I want to. I can pay for my niece and nephew. I can pay for my sister. I can pay for me to go back and take classes. But um, And then also I hear from people, oh, my kid's going to get a scholarship. What if they get a scholarship? Well, there are actually rules designed to be able to take the money out. If I get a $10,000 scholarship, I can take $10,000 out of the 529 without paying the penalty. I do have to pay taxes. But the change that has just been made actually helps fund retirement for the beneficiary. So now I can transfer $35,000 into a Roth IRA that we just talked about that then can grow for the beneficiary. And then when the beneficiary gets to retirement, that amount that I transferred tax-free plus all the growth in that account up until when Sally retires, we'll, she'll get out without paying any taxes. So really great that now I can help make this money into a retirement account for the beneficiaries. Sounds awesome. So Barbara, we are almost at time here. Would you mind quickly touching on what's kind of been a little bit of a hot button issue recently, Social Security? Absolutely. So Social Security, there actually haven't been any big policy changes to this. So everything you're hearing in the news about, you know, changes, nothing has actually happened from a policy perspective. The changes that you will hear about or, you know, see headlines about are related to inflation. Every year, if you are already receiving Social Security payments, the amount that you receive goes up by a cost of living adjustment. This past year, it happened to be very big. 8.7% of your social security payment went up if you're receiving them already. So that's a really cool thing to help people with all that inflation they had last year. They'll get a big payout this year. Hopefully inflation is not as much this year, so they can enjoy get that extra money. Um, every year for the next few years, the full retirement age continues to go up eventually to a point of the full retirement age being 67 for everybody. Um, but right now, people who were born in the 1956 to 1957, they're going to reach full retirement age this year. Um, the other thing I'll mention is Medicare Part B. 
Most people have their Medicare Part B premiums taken out of their Social Security check. So when that goes up, it takes a bite out of what you see hit your bank account every month. So this last year for 2022, inflation uh, for your Part B premiums was 5.6%. Um, so you got a big chunk taken out of your um, Social Security check. This year, Part B premiums have actually declined a little bit. So only by a few dollars, but what it does mean is that it didn't go up, so it won't take a bigger check out of your, ta out of your um, uh, Social Security check. And then the other thing I'll mention is that for everyone who's still working, which is probably most of the folks in our audience today, Social Security, you're paying into Social Security every, every, for every dollar that you are earning. You're paying 6.2%, your employer's paying another 6.2%. And you pay that up until the first $147,000 you earn every year, about well, for last year. Because of inflation, that took a big jump this year. And now high earners will be paying their Social Security tax up until the first $160,000 that they earn. So that number has gone up quite a bit. All right. Well, Barbara, kind of like a last little thing to close out on. I know that you have a certain mindset when it comes to taking your social security payments. And I was just kind of wondering if you could share that with us. I sure will. One of my favorite topics. So when you retire, you can apply for social security, hopefully not before full retirement age. But if you can delay taking your social security, if you have another way to pay for your first few years between 67 and 70, so the Social Security Administration will increase the amount of your payment that you'll receive by 8% for every year you delay. If you delay from 67 to 70, that's a 32% increase in the amount of your, of your Social Security payment every year for the rest of your life. And maybe even for your spouse's wife, if you're the high earner, then if you pass away before your spouse, your spouse will continue to get the larger social security check. So if you've increased it and you're the high earner, they get that money until the rest of their life. So if you are anywhere close to taking social security, give us a call and you know we can help you figure out what you ought to do for taking social, when you should be taking social security. Awesome. Well, oh, thank you, Barbara, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, this has been, once again, Jack and Barbara at 12 Points. Any questions that you may have that may have come up throughout the presentation, please feel free to direct them to either myself or Barbara, um, jack at 12points.com and barbara at 12points.com. We would be happy to answer any questions that may come up. Um, well, uh, you know, for 12 Points, Jack and Barbara. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Have a good one.